Welcome to our latest Nesta Talks, to Lavinia Stennett, CEO of the Black Curriculum. Nesta Talks is our conversational event series with today's most interesting thinkers focused on the big topics that will define our future. Please join the conversation in the comments box on the right hand side of your screen and ask any questions throughout the event. Closed captions can be accessed via a link to the stream in the description. I'm Dahlia Bengalim from Nesta, and I'm really looking forward to today's event. Lavinia founded the Black Curriculum in 2019 to address the lack of Black British history in the UK curriculum. She leads this amazing organization, delivering arts-focused Black history programs, providing teacher training and campaigning. Their campaign, Teach Black History 365, aims to ensure that Black history is embedded in the national curriculum. Learning Black history should not be a choice, but a fact of education. And for many, if not all of us, it doesn't take much to remember a time at school where there was a need for an organization like the Black Curriculum. For me, growing up in Australia, I, I remember celebrating Australia's bicentenary, 200 years since Captain James Cook discovered Australia. We were taught about an almost empty land and how the British bought culture and progress. And although that narrative is no longer dominant, and there has been significant progress in recognizing Aboriginal Australians, there is still a long way to go. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one. We all have a story to tell of a lack of diversity, a single historical narrative, stereotypes and racism. And so helping us both individually and collectively to change that, I'm delighted to hand over to Lavinia. Thank you very much, Dalia, for a lovely introduction and good afternoon to you all. Um, I'm Lavinia, founder CEO of the Black Curriculum, and today I'm going to um, share with you a presentation that I have around the importance and the centrality of Black history as it relates to the curriculum. So um, I will share my screen and yeah, we'll start. So um, today, thank you, Christina. So today I'll be talking more on black history and evolve history in our future. Um, and I just wanted to start with some questions around what key aspects of history do you remember that you learned in school? And, you know, Daddy has just started us off talking about the role of uh, Christopher Columbus and some kind of, um, well, as it relates to the Caribbean, some kind of histories that are kind of distorted um, from colonialism. So perhaps um, if you could enter into the chat box what you remember learning in school. Okay, so thank you. Someone said European dictators. Any other key aspects or periods in history that particularly strike you? Tudors, yeah. Tudors and Stuarts for sure. Yes, so um, I'm gonna yeah, World War II, founding of the NHS. Okay, that's great. Um, I think many of us, yes, did learn about Battle of Hastings, World War I, and you will not be surprised to hear that when we conducted a survey, we actually found um, that 72% of Brits learn about the Battle of Hastings versus 8% learning about the British, uh, the role of British colonization of Africa. Uh, 80 Six percent of Brits learnt about the Tudors in school, and nine percent of us learnt about uh, slavery in the British Industrial Revolution. And this was a survey conducted by Nell and Esme, who are um, founders of Impact of Omission, and this was conducted last year. And again, it bears strong resemblance to what is in the chat at the moment. Loads of Tudors, loads of Queens, um, some kind of um, topics there as it relates to the Battle of Hastings, but it shows that our education system actually has a very archaic an outdated mode of learning when it comes to um, thinking about topics that are on the national curriculum and also within curriculums in schools fundamentally they're not really designed to ensure that um, stu students actually have um, the skills and also the education that will enable them to really think about how they will fit within the future when we think about what the stu the stewards and also the tutors um, do for us in terms of our learning um, I really want to kind of focus on what that actually means and how um, how early teaching actually uh, intervenes and um, 
takes away actually the agency from a lot of young people. Um, if we were to really think about the critical role of the industrial revolution um, and slavery within that, I'm absolutely sure that young people will have much more understanding and also a more direction when it comes to challenging some of the ongoing legacies um, that we see in today, such as neocolonial rules um, and also what we know today to be the Commonwealth, which I'll talk more on later. So it's shown us here that I think perhaps there needs to be more of a focus that actually is enriching for young people and gives young people a sense of um, real world issues and real world um, topics that you know will inform the lives that they will go on to lead. What does the current guidance say? So this is relating to um, topics on the national curriculum, which at the moment 25% of schools across um, England are using to teach. So as part of a broad and uh, balanced curriculum, pupils should be taught about different societies and how different groups have contributed to the development of Britain. So I think that really refers more to the idea that you know, in Britain as a multicultural country, um, and I use that in quotes, we have an obligation to really learn about the different kind of contributions there. But in Key Stage 1, there isn't really that much reference to um, the lives of people in Britain. What we see here is rather a reference to Rosa Parks, um, again, thinking about American history, which, you know, is important for us to learn about global histories. But again, thinking about the presence of Black Britons in the UK, it's even more critical that we have um, an interjection of um, knowledge that actually um, enables young students to see themselves um, on the streets and also in buildings and um, in the physical kind of makeup of Britain um, that relates to black histories and not just in America, of course. Um, and then we've also got the example of Mary C. Cole, which I think is quite um, interesting because it's kind of valuing her contribution based on um, Britain's role. Um, so when I think about, you know, the state and how um, certain provisions are made in exception in the exceptions of um, wars, um, the focus is always heavily on, you know, the roles that black people played within the wars. Um, and particularly when it comes to women, um, the focus is always on nursing. And I think, you know, uh, black people and also black women are much more, um, um, multifaceted and the kind of single focus on you know this very mothering aspect can actually fall into a very dangerous stereotype so thinking about you know broadening the broadening those narratives perhaps at key stage one will help to enrich um, young people's views of what um, possible careers are um, available when they're older but also more importantly giving them a wider world view of um, the reality in key stage two um in the national curriculum guidance, there's a study of a non-European society that provides contrasts with British history. And I think the key word within that to really understand is contrasts. What do we mean by contrasts? Um, because we know that the global orders we have it at the moment where we have developed and quote unquote underdeveloped countries um, does not really allow for uh, critical nuance and understanding in how those countries ended up being um, underdeveloped. So when we're thinking about contrasts, how are we threading in um, the experiences and also the understandings of um, black people um, across British society, but also in British colonies? Because I'll speak more about that later, but that is also a very key, ele a very key element of what we're trying to achieve when we're thinking about embedding black histories. Um, across the curriculum. And lastly, we have Key Stage 3, an in-depth study of the impact throughout time of migration to people from and within British Isles. The Key Stage also includes examples of development and the end of the British Empire and Britain's transatlantic slave trade. So there's quite a lot here. So it's eventual abolition as well. And I think within Key Stage 3, um, you know, the examples absolutely should be more clearer. So we have at the Black Curriculum developed some more guidance because um, as it pertains to Key Stage 3, there are key aspects of, you know, thinking about the role of the British um, slave trade um, that can't just be taught within one subject or, um, you know, one lesson, unfortunately. So what we're advocating for is that across the curriculum, so from music to English to math um, and also history, of course, geography, there are wide and also very deep enriched examples of black histories um, there. To give an example for Key Stage 3, um, you have such great writers such as Kamal Braithwaite, 
um, who can be used in the English curriculum. Um, and also, um, when we're thinking about history as well, there is a key um, focus there on the role of abolition um, outside of Britain. So we know, you know, um, William Wilberforce, and we have examples of, you know, people in the past who have um, aided the support of the end of, you know, um, the slave trade. But there are also countless examples of people within um, England and also outside of England um, um, within black communities who have actually helped um, propagate that, but we don't know their names, we don't know what actions they've taken. Um, and um, it would be great if we could shed more light on that so people have more of an idea of what it takes to actually end movements. So when we're thinking about, again, drawing those parallels um, between today and the past, young people can have a reference to think about, okay, what does allyship perhaps look like in the 21st century and how can we use um, the past as a way to kind of guide us there? So in all, um, what I'm trying to say essentially is that the current guidance is, is very, um, it's not really created in a way where it allows young people to think critically. Um, and lastly, it doesn't um, have much examples, but it's very rigid. And so our campaign, TBH365, actually aims to change that. So we have suggested some examples here, for example, um, and um, I will now speak about the map of the British Empire. So as you can see, there are a couple of circles, um, namely Africa and uh, the Caribbean. So we've zoomed in here, and in that space, there are a number of Caribbean islands that were essentially kind of used within um, a trade agreement um, for economic purposes between um, Africa, Britain, and the Caribbean. So to be more specific, uh, the Caribbean islands of Jamaica and Barbados were used mainly as sugar trade um, to yeah, it was used for the sugar trade to really develop um, sugar. Um, so um, plantations were kind of set up as a mode so that Britain could essentially import sugar, um, which ultimately became, as we know, um, a very widely used commodity from what used to be a very um, upper class um, commodity to use within tea, which is also a product from um, India. So the British Empire, its fundamental purpose was really to kind of um, uh, yeah, extract for economic gain. And within that process, you found political and also cultural subjugation um, and also compliance from um, some uh, actors within um, the slave trade or the enslaved experience, I'd say, rather than slave trade. Um, and I'll kind of speak about more why I'm choosing to use that language as well. Um, but I wanted to draw attention also to the fact that um, within those countries, there were cultural practices um, and also ways of doing and being that um, I think really go undocumented in um, the narratives and the kind of historical context that we know about the British Empire. From what we know, um, as I said, it's very kind of um, economic based. Um, and what we have at the moment in terms of the, the mainstream narratives is that you know, black people were just drawn from Africa to be slaves in um, the Caribbean. But what we actually have is a story and a journey of migration that's much more complex and nuanced. Um, so the journeys from um, Africa to the Caribbean often involved many um, people being um, thrown overboard, many people lo losing their lives. Um, also, um, many Caribbean people well, yeah, people who carried from Africa to the Caribbean actually setting up kind of um, new ways of um, existing. So what I would call like small polities, um, which I'll talk more about in a second as well. So we see this, um, this journey of, I guess, cultural and also um, spiritual migration from um, a, a very rich and vast continent in terms of its resources, its outlook, um, its diversity as well. Um, and then coming to the Caribbean to bring um, not only riches back to, to Europe, but also existence to the islands as we know it today. So I think this is exactly why um, when I'm thinking about um, the role of the British Empire, we cannot solely focus on um, the fact that there were simply communities who existed in the Caribbean and you know, that was the end of the story. Now there is, you know, these wonderful islands that we can go to take beautiful trips to. But actually the story is, again, um, it's never ending because migration um, is a theme that has always been since, you know, the start, the inception 
and even before the inception of colonialism, when we're thinking about um, Romans um, and their early settlements um, and black Romans, there have been evidences of um, many, uh, many communities and also many individuals of different class backgrounds and net worths um, and if you like um, genders as well who have settled in the UK. Um, Stuart Hall, you know, speaks about this this idea that you know the British cannot recon reconcile themselves with this idea of racism because often when we think about um, you know racism, we often point to the arrivals of um, migrants in the 50s and the 60s, but it actually predates that um, by centuries and hundreds of years. So it's really important when we're thinking about our, our narratives and where we are trying to um, draw attention to. Um, the British Empire cannot always be the sole, the sole focus of what we're trying to do. However, I think it does provide a lot more detailed um, understanding about the um, the position that Europe has played, but also the kind of ideologies that have sustained um, to, to, to the point of where we are at now. So as you see there, I've got some um, arrows um, pointing to cities in the UK, um, including Cardiff, Bristol, Liverpool, London, and Glasgow. Why? Because these are key places that um, black communities um, had been in before um, World War One. Um, so my grand uncle was one of the first RAF soldiers that came um, from Jamaica to actually support World War One, but he settled in London, not Bristol. Um, and then you had um, over the space of um, 20 years more migration um, following, sorry, 30 years following 1919, um, which was um, the time of the war and um, also within Glasgow as well um, not only were there people but there were also physical um, and I would I would say more geographical reminders of the presence of slavery as well so you can also go up to Glasgow and also Liverpool today to actually see some of the things um, such as the buildings that were um, created through slavery essentially and um, the names um, and there are great kind of um, walks and experiences that you can go to see that as well, um, such as with Tony Walker. So um, I'm going to move on and um, focus here on the type of migration that happened in 1914. So um, the black population grew at rapid speed after soldiers and technicians decided to settle in the mentioned cities after World War I. Um, for example, in Cardiff, there were 700 black people. Um, and, you know, a couple of years later, five years later, that number uh, essentially tripled. So um, when we're thinking about migration to Britain, um, it's not just, again, um, an individual or a family that is just a number. I think I've provided numbers here to show you quantitatively what the reality was, but these are also people with many different stories and reasons why they came to Britain, often um, through very, uh, I'd just say clever modes, essentially used of marketing to enable them to come to the Isles of Britain to be able to support the economy. Um, so. A lot of my practice is using the Caribbean as a framework. I have written a lot on maroon communities and also um, the Caribbean contribution. Sorry, one second. There we go. Um, the Caribbean contributions as well to um, the UK. So as I said, the islands were used for subsistence, um, particularly before um, the arrival of the Spanish um, and in some cases the Portuguese as well. Um, so mainly they were cultures um, you know, predominantly um, used by Arawak communities and um, indigenous communities essentially for land and uh, yeah, water. And the arrival of the Spanish uh, subsequently and the English in 1605 um, changed the kind of economic and social landscape, giving um, not only a different dynamic towards how people interact with the land, but also how um, they interact with each other essentially. And the societies that we see today are a direct kind of culmination of that. So when we understand, you know, Jamaica's motto, for example, out of many one people, what we're actually understanding is that, yes, this is a culmination of cultures, um, politics, and also practices that have allowed us to see what, what is existing today. So during colonial rule, the, co the codes of cultures adapted within the framework um, that existed, and these included West African, indigenous, and European cultures. Um, Often we don't really kind of focus on the European influence um, outside of slavery, but I think, again, there are many examples that we can point to within our cultures today that show, um, 
I guess the um, interaction, I'd say, of all three of these communities, um, ethnicities, communities. Um, so in terms of how we think about teaching black history, um, I come from a place, again, of using the Caribbean as a framework, but also really thinking about how we can provide agency um, to subjects, particularly as Europe has been centered in the process of um, really kind of dehumanizing um, its subjects um, because of the enslavement. Um, so when we're thinking about agency and what that looks like for people, it could look like resistance, it could also look like just being able to survive. Um, and it could also look very radical. And I say radical in the sense of um, creating new systems. And so one of my um, papers have focused on marine communities, uh, which essentially derives from the term Cimarron, which means to flee. Um, and marine communities are found in Jamaica, Brazil, Suriname, US and Cape Verde. And um, they're not all called marine communities just because of language changes. But essentially what it means is that, you know, outside of the colonial framework, there was um, essentially communities who ran away and, you know, set up uh, communities for themselves. Then, um, the, these accounts give us insight into the framework of colonial Jamaica. So the role of black histories across the curriculum is firstly um, to enhance, so I should go back and actually tell you where to access my research. So you can find it, it's a very long title, but it's called An Exploration of Agency Within Maroon Ecological Practice on Earth in the Histories of Marine Ecology in Jamaica and Brazil from 1630 to 1780. And you can find that online. Um, and Lastly, the role of black issues across the curriculum is to enhance the provision of quality education. So again, thinking about the different narratives that we're using um, and thinking about the different kind of insights that could be enriched, not only to enhance the numbers and you know the narratives, the general narratives that we know, but going more deeper into understanding the complexity of human life. So it's not just an add-on so that we can you know, fill a box or just say that we know it, but allowing ourselves to go deeper to understand how humanity has functioned in the past. Um, secondly, we want to challenge European binaries and harmful categorizations, including the idea of moving from subhuman, um, well, yeah, well, including the idea of you know, people being subhuman. So moving from this idea of being subhuman to human through the role of agency. And lastly, using oral stories and cross-functional skills across the curriculum to make sure that young people have um, the skills that are needed again for their futures. So at the Black Curriculum, uh, which I founded in 2019 after studying in New Zealand, which was the best experience ever. I also was doing a degree at SOAS, my first undergraduate degree in African studies. So it was just a culmination of loads of ideas and a really powerful kind of um, involvement with um, not only colonialism, but the recognition of culture um, and a pride and also a celebration of culture. So when I founded it in 2019, I think it was at a point where I, I, I saw that there was a glaring omission in terms of um, an institutional approach to addressing what black history could do in the UK. Um, and in terms of rectifying past inaccuracies, um, we needed something that could provide students with um, I guess, yeah, just information. So we started off very kind of localized. We piloted in three schools of a curriculum and the take up was absolutely exceptional. Um, students were saying that, yes, this is like what we needed. The teachers were very receptive. And um, in the end, it was very powerful to, I wouldn't say in the end, but at the end of the pilot, it was really powerful to see that a vision that I had, literally in a lecture in New Zealand was something that was being taken up and being met with such kind of enthusiasm um, so, um, in terms of, um, you know, what else we do, we also have, um, teacher training services now. We, um, you know, provide training for governors too in, in schools. And, um, also we do out of school workshops for young people on weekends. So again, building on this movement of Saturday schools, which was something that was pioneered by Caribbean communities in the UK. Um, there's a really good documentary called, um, educationally subnormal, uh, which basically details um, some of the treatment that black Caribbean students face and why Saturday schools were kind of used as a way to navigate the education system. Um, so on that, the last thing that we do is also campaign. So we are campaigning as um, 
Dahlia mentioned in the beginning, we have a campaign called TBH 365, which stands for Teach Black History 365, but also playing on the idea of being honest. So to be honest, you know, are we being honest with ourselves, with the history that we have? How can we ensure that the people, the young people that we are serving are being reflected in an honest way as well? So um, I'm there with an MP, um, or former MP, um, and essentially just um, campaigning for that to happen. And um, we have also done some work in primary schools, secondary schools. We work in all kinds of schools across the UK. We are currently in five cities, um, including London, Liverpool, Birmingham, Bristol, and uh, Manchester. And with hopes to kind of um, increase the number of cities we're working in for um, the enhancement of local histories, but also more importantly, for black history to be mandated across the UK, which is our ultimate vision for every young person to be empowered with a sense of identity and belonging. And then lastly, we also do some corporate work. So we have um, corporate workshops that run for organizations because again, if we're trying to influence young people, we have to be able to help their gatekeepers, so essentially parents, teachers, grandparents, and you know wider society. So we run information sessions for corporates to really learn about um, black history. Um, and they are very interactive and allow everyone to kind of be involved in you know shaping the culture of what it is that we need for our um, society going forward. So um, I've put some information here around where you can find more of, uh, more of our work. So you have the black curriculum on Instagram um, and then curriculum black. We haven't got the black curriculum yet I've been saying this for the last year so I hope someone from Twitter is listening um we need the black curriculum for Twitter and we are also on the website which is the black curriculum.com and you can also find us on a course we have a course on future learn um which enables teachers to really embed black histories and you can find that on future learn um website that you, you just type in the black curriculum and future learn and you can do a short course on black histories there and um, in terms of next steps, actions to embed black histories, you can write to your local MP to develop a group to connect parents and teachers in the constituency. So again, thinking about bringing community actors together to really understand what the issues are um, with the schools in the area of teaching it, how well they're teaching it, what kind of interventions are needed, um, what are the students saying? So bringing those kind of consortiums together that your MP can kind of work on. Um, you can offer your time and expertise to support young people in developing a campaign again around black histories there's been some incredible and fantastic young people who have really driven this um i'm not really a young person no more i'm 24 so i'm like i'm on the border um but there are many people younger than me who are also kind of advocating for this and i think the more voices the better we will achieve the aim of embedding black histories into the national curriculum so you can help those young people with your time and expertise and lastly you can donate to organizations in this space including ours and um others who are um also appearing um and we you know as leaders in this space are helping to um make sure that everyone's kind of united and you know the will isn't being replicated as well so um that's it for me and i'm gonna close now so thank you very much for listening wow wow <laughs> so much in there lavinia that was fantastic i think what you've really done brilliantly um is really firstly expanding all of our knowledge and understanding well certainly me on a personal level but also that amazing thing where you give very practical um questions and examples that teachers and campaigners can just pick up and run with but also linking it to the broad, broader narrative question and whilst everyone else is submitting um some questions um in the chat um i'm going to ask the first question about i'm really interested with covid kind of really exposing many structural inequalities to people who might not have seen them before. Um, what kind of trends are you seeing and what opportunities do you think that that leads to? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. It's just a question about kind of with COVID really um, sharpening our focus around structural inequalities and racism in a way that I think a lot of people didn't think um, that they existed in the way that you know is the day-to-day -day experience. What opportunities do you think that that gives you now that there seems to be more momentum around issues that you're working on and a recognition of structural racism? Yeah, I think that's a really, really incredible question. And you use the right word, which is momentum. I think what didn't exist before was a widespread kind of awareness of 
an issue um, in a way that enabled us to really kind of talk about it openly. Um, so when I was in New Zealand, that was one of the things that I, I noticed and I really appreciated was the fact that people wanted to have those kind of challenging conversations and didn't shy away. At least if they did, they still acknowledged that there was a problem. I think now we're in a space where um, you know, we have language, we have resources and also um, push, I'd say like willingness as well, which is more important because it's more about your mindset and how you approach these kind of conversations, your willingness to approach those um, that really kind of enable us to think about structural change. Um, so I would say that we are in a better place, but I'd say that there's still a lot more kind of um, deeper diving that we can go into because this isn't a work that can be completed overnight at all. Like, unfortunately we have milestones that we can we can definitely reach. So for example, you know, embedding back issues into the national curriculum, all we need to do really is get a minister to sign it off. And that's as simple as it is, but it's very challenging as we know, because it's, you know, there's resistance and there's pushback, but the more we can have these conversations, I'm absolutely sure that we can, you know, convince this, this government and also future governments about the role of education, the role that black history can play to address those kind of structural um, issues that, you know, maybe they acknowledge, maybe they don't, but we still see. So, um, yeah. And then I have, so at Nesta, we're working, you know, the mission that we're working on is a fairer start and really narrowing some of the education gaps, um, both in the early years and throughout um, a children's school life. How how should we be armed? What kind of information? What's our role? How do you see our role in working with you and working with schools to really use kind of closing this gap um, and really thinking about the curriculum in a different way? I think mainly it's, it's supporting teachers and, and finding ways to really enhance the teacher's experience because over the last year we've known that there's been so many different challenges that teachers personally have faced and also professionally as well the onus is you know squarely on them to ensure that this teaching gets done and what the government hasn't been quite supportive of doing is making sure that you know there is a framework that exists outside of teachers so that they can do their work a lot more easier um so I think you know to enable teachers to really kind of find space to do this there needs to be more interventions from you know organizations like ours um you know the third sector and also private, the private sector as well, in terms of thinking about um, just providing more uh, resources um, and, and also time, giving teachers that time to really think for themselves um, to enable the students that they're going to be teaching. So, yeah. That's really interesting. And then the other thing that's come up in the chat a little bit is around um, some of the kind of response to George Floyd. Um, to the death of George Floyd and and kind of how, you know, um, statues have been torn down, street names have been uh, changed or there's campaigns. Where do you sit on all of those arguments? I mean, they, they are largely symbolic, but symbolism makes a massive difference. And where, you know, in terms of trying to kind of um, really push on a number of different fronts, where do you think that energy, you know, and how to harness that energy? Sure, so I think um, harnessing energy can happen on a number of fronts, um, particularly because there's not one way to change things. I think, you know, the work that we're doing in education is definitely for the long term, um, but, you know, within communities that have been traumatized through the acts of um, continued, um, you know, poverty, um, also the backdrop of, um, you know, colonialism and the way that it has presented and also kind of gaslighted more recently some of the effects of that, I can definitely understand and empathize with people who want to take matters into their own hands. I think the national psyche, um, in terms of where we remember what is British and what we identify as British, um, can be very triggering and it is, seeing, it is seen in statutes. And I do think that, you know, unless they serve a purpose, which often they do not because there is no context, there is no engagement with those statues, even before they were torn down, you know, there's no real reason for them to be there. So that's where I stand. I think we absolutely need to re be think rethinking about the role that um, colonialism plays in, you know, practical everyday life. So statues, memorials, um, and really kind of think about why we do things because, you know, traditions don't always have to be um, so embedded and ingrained. They can change. They can, mm. and change is always a bad thing. 
I think it's really a thinking about, um, you know, integrating everyone's experiences and not just um, those who have power. It's really interesting and it links to one of the questions that's coming through on the chat about kind of where you think the main reasons are that people are pushing back on changes. And I think some of the debate around um, different kinds of, you know, statues and, and exactly what you talked about very much link into kind of challenging people's identity and self mm -hmm. and being very scared of change and confronting a past that, that is not always, um, you know, uh, you know, rose tinted really, and and to really think about things differently. So, so what what are the reasons that you find in your work where there's pushback? Yeah, I think more on a practical side, it's like again, teach us how we're going to do this. Like, where's the time? Um, mm. We also have to teach, you know, emotional literacy. We also have to teach um, now, like guidance on like um, sex ed, and there are so many different kind of things that priorities that teachers are facing. It's like for them it's often how can we do this? So I wouldn't say it's more of a pushback, but it's more like finding the actual pathways to be able to integrate this that doesn't take away from anything else. Um, secondly, I'd also say that within, um, you know, this, this very fractured system of education, how can we create a large scale change that isn't kind of just driven by, um, yeah, money essentially, because it's, it's, it's privatized and, um, I'm sorry, I'm referring to the UK's education system. So some of the schools, for those that don't know, um, are state owned and then others are privatized and you kind of see them through academies. You often hear X and X Academy, um, which is, you know, um, another kind of business essentially. And I think, again, if we are thinking about, you know, equality across the education system, and I've also missed out private schools as well, um, how can we have, um, a, a fair education for everyone that doesn't just prioritize schools that can afford um to you know educate their students but what about you know other schools that have um i guess yeah like a geographical like just isolated geographically perhaps or just don't have the means or the finances or even the, the infrastructure oh <laughs> I think Lavinia just dropped out at a really interesting point about um, kind of resources for schools and really thinking about the surrounding infrastructure. Um, I'm just going to hold on a minute to see whether she's going to come back um, because now there's a number of questions coming through the chat about curriculum, about kind of resources that teachers can use um, and about kind of things being different in different areas. So, for example, in Wales, really thinking about, you know, where there's devolved power over education and the ability to write a different curriculum about children being taught racism and contributions of Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities as part of the new curriculum. And I guess a lot of the work that we're doing at Nesta is working very local um, with local authorities and really thinking about that balance, not necessarily waiting for central government to make the changes at policy or legislative level that we need, um, but really thinking about what we can do locally with a community, whether that's a cohort, uh, whether that's, a you know, by age of child, um, by demographic or by socioeconomic characteristic and really thinking about it. I'm just having a look at Helen Wales's comments um, particularly about the Welsh context, which I think is really interesting. And she goes on to say that schools will develop their own curricula, drawing on what matters locally, nationally and globally. And then the question when Lavinia comes back is about what advice to give to teachers who are gearing up to do that, to make that as valu valuable as possible. And the Black, Black Curriculum have got fantastic resources available on their website, and many of them are free. Um, but there was also a question earlier from um, That's My Book, Dion, about uh, thinking whether or not uh, there are kind of coalitions and who people are working with in terms of publishing resources um, that are kind of accurate and robust and really feel like they're challenging. Um, I'm going to I'm just going to pose a few of the questions that have come through because I feel like within the audience, there's really such an amazing kind of experience. I think Lavinia is having some Wi-Fi problems in our new well or not so new world of really being able to connect. 
Um, and so from Nikki Parchment, there was a question. I work for a cultural organization. There's a real desire for third space learning to change their approach to teaching and learning. And how do you see your work reaching beyond that classroom? And I think it would be great if people could pop in some comments, perhaps from the work that they do about how they see their work really contributing both within the classroom environment and perhaps outside of the classroom environment. Um, because I feel like there are so many good examples out there. It's just often difficult um, to really be able to share them with people they need to know. Um, I think I'm just scrolling down as we talk and, and Catherine talks about it's important to start this early. We've recently published Key Stage 1 image and support notes for famous Black Britons. Catherine, if you're able to pop in a link to the chat um, of where others might be able to access those resources, um, I think that would be fantastic because a number of the different questions are coming up. Um, around um, how people are able to access resources, particularly with a point that Lavinia made around how pushed for time people are and really how hard it is to be able to find that time to find the space when there are so many competing demands on teachers and also in the wake of, of students coming back to school um, leaving school, coming back to school, exam pressure in, in kind of later school life and in, within the early years, you know, different periods of isolation and being backwards and, and forwards. I think those kinds of things that can really take pressure off teachers' time and also think about um, how to kind of collectively pull some resources are really essential. Um, going back to some of the questions, we're still struggling with the connections, so apologies, and thank you so much for bearing with us. Um, Diana said, well, being taught about racism and its issues is vital. Do you also think it's important to exhaust Black excellence and Black achievements through the teaching of Black history as well? Um, and I wonder if we're not able to get Lavinia back in the next couple of minutes, whether that's something um, that she'll be able to reflect on and share back um, in the chat. And then I can see a number of, um, of comments coming through from Serving My Jesus about um, different um, periods. And I saw a couple earlier around periods of history not reflected at all um, in any part of the curriculum that's taught at the moment. So for example, in 1981, 14 black lives were lost in a fire in New Cross. Investigation into the fire was not done well by the police a 30 and 40 year memorial by local council, but it's been unrecognized. And then another example, also by Serving My Jesus, a significant black landmarks in history, such as the 1919 rally and Windrush are now not widely known in the UK. And how can we highlight these events? Um, and I guess, you know, I guess there are a number of, of things happening um, I think progress feels very slow um, and it never feels fast enough. But I wonder in linking back towards what Lavinia said before about really being able to think about some of the momentum and where we can really think about how as organisations like Nesta and many others, we can add to that momentum. Um, I think we, uh, we have lost <laughs> the connection with Lavinia. And so massive, massive apologies for that. Um, I feel like we've had such a rich conversation and presentation from her, which will be available on the YouTube channel. Um, there is a survey for you to fill in um, if you're able to spare a couple of minutes. Um, and also please keep the questions coming and we'll certainly pose them and then repost it on the channel. Um, so thank you so much for your time on this Wednesday lunchtime. Apologies again for wrapping up a little bit early. Hopefully it means you've got 10 minutes back in your day um, to do what you haven't um, been able to do. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to Lavinia um, who has given us her time and really challenging, thought provoking and a history lesson all in one. Um, so thank you everyone for joining Nesta Talks um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Take care, bye.